my tent. It is the Z-Pax Plexamid. Very light. Um, I got the heavier fabric, so I'm about an ounce heavier than the very light model. But it's like 15 ounces out of the factory. Of course, you have to add your stakes and the bag to that that holds it. And that's at about 20 point something. So, here we go. The front end, and I have one door rolled open. Which is usually the standard way to do it. So that um, you don't get too much condensation in there overnight. However, you can go ahead and knock it half down. I have a clip for that. And this could be a little better. Here, let me do just that. So you put it more at a 45 degree angle, right around here, here. And I'll do that, because I'm gonna sleep in it tonight, because it's supposed to be down around 23 degrees. And I'm hoping I won't need it. You'll notice there's another sleeping bag, that cylindrical thing in the back. And that is a 30 degree bag. The one that's laying out and fluffing back up again is a 15 degree bag. And there is a mattress down there with an R value of 4.5 underneath there. Well, hello. I am walking in uh, Seven Lakes Park, Benton, Michigan. And it's a nice day. It's in the 40s. It was originally supposed to go down to 21 degrees tonight, but uh, now it says like 30 something, so not going to be as cold. I came out here to do another test on my cold weather gear for my upcoming AK through hike. Now, most of the AK will be. Okay, but the first leg where it's allowed to be real cold is the Smoky Mountains. And I do want to make sure I can get through the 20s. My last test was in my backyard, and it was the upper 20s. And I did okay, but I am curious if I can get to the lower 20s. So, I'm not going to make my original plan unless the weather changes again. It is kind of very windy, which I don't like, but I may get to check out how well the tent holds up in the wind. Although, reports back from everyone on that model of tent indicates it'll be just fine. Now, since I haven't introduced myself, um, Richie, my channel is Walks with Donor, so that's the name I'll probably be going by, and the name is because I had a double lung transplant in 2012, August 1st, and on my fifth year, 2017, the doctor was pleasantly surprised that how well I was doing. He said most people plateau in their third or fourth year as far as increased lung capacity and function and physical prowess, which is, he says he's, you know, good with that. He says, but you're keeping on going. You've, you know, increased another, what was it, 10 or 15 percent this year, every year. And I was doing very well. And I looked around and said, okay, you know, to celebrate this, because if you didn't know, the life expectancy for a lung transplant patient is five years. And there I was. And it was everything in sight for doing another who knows how many years. There have been people who have done well over 20 years. But I think now the life expectancy is six years. So it's moving up. They're getting better at it. 
and a lot of the uh, drugs are getting better and techniques, etc., etc. So, so 2018, I got my stuff together, and I was accumulating stuff, and I did a small stint in Vermont. I planned a week, 50 miles, between Barrington or Burlington. Now, I forget now. Uh, but it was ended up in Rutland, so it was 50 miles south of Rutland. And I would end up in Rutland. Anyhow, it really kicked my butt. And I got 20 miles. The first two days were awful. I got two miles the first day. And then the second day, I got even better. I got one mile. <laughs> so I sat and had a talk with myself that night. And over the next three days is when I do really got the, what, 17 miles that were left. Which wasn't so bad. So I learned a lot. I had to lighten my load quite a bit and be in better shape. So I went back and I did that. Unfortunately, I was going through rejection at the time and spent a lot of time in 2018 and part of 2019 first diagnosing exactly what it was and then going for treatment. So in March 2019, and that's when I had I'd hoped to leave April 15th for the trail. Um, they were treating me. I spent 10 days in the hospital. Thymoglobin, or RAT-G, more common name, and, or globin, not globin. And I did okay on the treatment, and it seems to have arrested the progress of the rejection. But I did lose, I was blowing about 130% of expected capacity doing very well and now I'm doing about 80% of expected capacity somewhere between 70 and 80 you know, it changes every time you take it you know, it's like your weight on a scale every morning it's a little different so oh this is a tricky little spot flip the thing do that I've got plenty of water on me. So, they treated me for that. The problem is when you're on that much anti rejection meds, uh, some of them have a uh, tendency to pour the weight on. <laughs> I got up to about 180 pounds. So, and then I had to do a month where I was kind of in quarantine in a house. So, I did go for a hike <laughs> with my daughter and her husband and uh, three other adults, and uh, I performed pitifully. That was Memorial Day. So, I kept on working out and adjusting things, and then I went down to Amicalola Falls on around the 15th of July. And, hey, you think I failed the first time? <laughs> now, I was like 5 or 10 pounds lighter. I think I was 38 uh, pounds when I did the original Vermont turn. And this one, I think I was 32. So, that was uh, an improvement, but not improvement enough. I did the stairs. I'd been working very hard, and I did the stairs. Took an hour and a half, but I was impressed that I did them. And then, you know, there's supposed to be a sign at each intersection. There isn't. And there is a red blaze there. And unfortunately, I don't know what it means. Uh, it's not that big a place. I'm going to just walk around. I got four hours before the sun sets. So, <laughs> anyhow, where was I? Oh, I got up the stairs, 
which was very nice. You're talking 600 steps for those who don't know. And it goes up the waterfall. And uh, it wasn't easy. I did about, well, I had practiced on the stairs at home and I could do about three flights and then stop, catch my breath, three flights and catch my breath and just continued in that fashion. So it took a while. And then what happened? Well, I wasn't walking very fast, unfortunately. Now the average hiker, when they're going, they average out about two miles an hour. The better ones and the faster ones, the stronger ones, younger ones, however you want to put it, do more than that. It's not uncommon for people to do two and a quarter, two and a half. When you start getting over three, that's more very athletic and, you know, probably unachievable for someone like me. However, two is the normal thing. And I remember the year before, there was a lady who was doing one mile an hour. And I thought, oh my goodness, she's not going to make it. Well, to make a long story short, she didn't make it. But I did enjoy watching her. She had a different view of things. Anyhow, I realized after about four or five hours, I was doing a half a mile an hour. And I was working hard. <laughs> so, I set my camp up for the night, which was nice. Thought about things, called home. Woke up in the next morning, and oh, I got water along the way. I got more water. Anyhow, when I woke up the next morning, I said, okay, today I'll get to the top of the mountain. You know, the springer is where it starts. And this approach trail is about, it's nine miles virtually. It's 8.8. .8. Every time you look up mileage anywhere, you look it up in two different places, you get two different answers. So it's between eight and nine miles from the, the archway to Springer Mountain. Anyhow, it doesn't really matter too much because I was doing my rapid half a mile an hour thing and I was trying to, let's see, afternoon I was trying to figure out, you know, start looking for where am I going to spend the night. And I'm disappointed at this point, obviously. Uh, I think I'd gotten two more miles, or two and a half again. And the next three shelters up there, I'm reading in gut hooks and I'm reading the comments. And there's kind of bear activity. So I'm saying, well, you know, the best way to not get caught in a storm is to avoid it. So the best way to not have be harassed by a bear is don't go up there. Now, I probably could have made it to one of those two or three shelters on the way up or camp areas, not shelters, actually. So I said, you know what? I'll stop down here. So I stopped there for the night, set up, looked at things, you know, enjoyed it. Anyhow, the next morning I wake up and, oh, I did have a bear encounter in Vermont. Not a big one, not no big deal. But so this is my second bear encounter. Only this time I wake up and I've got the fly creek. So the fly creek is my tent and it's a, uh, you have to crawl in like a tube. It's one door and the opening's on the end. To give an A-frame where one end is blocked off. So I get up and I swish out of, out of the thing. I realize, okay, rather than get changed in here, I could probably put my pants on out there. Nobody's out there. And I get my body about halfway out the tent. And I look over to my left. And there's a bear. And fortunately, I did what I was supposed to do. And my food bag was hanging about 50 feet away from where I was. And in the tree, like it's supposed to be. However, it could have been better. It could have been higher. And 
Oh, you're supposed to keep this up. I'm apologizing. You may cut all this up and give me pointers. I don't know. Anyhow, this sucker, this bear, is playing pinata with my bear bag. He's not connecting. It's just out of his reach. But he is jumping and he is swatting. And given enough time, he might have reached it. Maybe not. But I'm wondering, how long has he been there? I had no idea until I looked. And then I'm running my head through the things of what you're supposed to do when you see a bear. And it's, you know, don't look vulnerable. Yeah, a guy falling out of his thing in a horizontal position. <laughs> Doesn't look very aggressive, very intimidating. So I quickly got out and as quick as I could and stood up and puffed up my shoulders. Oh, five foot five of me. So I'm looking very threatening to a bear. <laughs> and I talked. Fortunately, I have a little bit of a deep voice. I said, but I remember thinking, oh shit, I don't want to deal with this today. So now this is interesting. Look, it's the lumbar. Limbo, limbo, rock. Limbo, limbo, rock. Oh, oh. don't play limbo rock with a backpack. <laughs> I caught it. It's that high, and I still caught it. Okay. So, where was I? So, I get out. And it looks like a young bear to me. He's got a nose like a, what is it, Doberman? It's brown. The nose is brown, and the, the whole snout is brown. And the rest of him is black. But he doesn't look like he's been worn out in the jungle or anything. He looks pretty young. So, anyhow. He's trying to get the food. And I look at him, and he looks at me. And we, I kind of lock eyes. I'm trying to figure out, okay, is it time for me to get the trekking poles? Or at least I have some kind of spear. Or, uh, you know, I'm trying to figure out what, what I do next. As I'm, you know mumbling in a deep voice as much as I can and he's looking at me and he's wondering the same thing should I get my knife and fork a little bit of seasoning or should I go down the hill and you can see the both of us thinking and I guess it was five or ten seconds but it felt like a good minute and finally he turned around and within five seconds he was gone you, you would have never known he was there so, that was good. Whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm hoping you can see that. That's a footprint. Now, judging by where I am, I'm guessing that, that is somebody's dog. But I'm not good at tracking. I haven't had that much experience at it. And if it's not a dog, it's somebody I don't want to meet. So... And it's relatively fresh. That I can tell. It's on top of the footprint. Which leaves more credence to the fact that it might be a dog. I just stopped at one of those poles with a map and directions. And I am where I want to be. Actually, I should actually show you that. Let me do that. Okay. I don't know if you see that or not. Because I'm not flipping the... To the other camera except now i will because it's interesting so let me flip the camera around for the forward camera and you can't do that can you no you can't hmm interesting so let me do this and you can see the water goes that way see the water dial goes that way Whoa, big, big claws again. I'm guessing it looks like a 40 or 50 pound lab or something. I'm hoping. I'm hoping it's not an independent uh, operator out here. <laughs> uh, where the hell was I? Oh, the bear. So the bear went off and I packed my stuff up. Not a big deal, except after I did breakfast, 
and I took my meds, which unfortunately um, were only in about 15, 20 minutes before they came back out the way they went in. And so now I'm debating on whether or not I got a, how much of a dose I got, you know, how much was actually um, absorbed, which is what happens every time you regurgitate. Uh, right after taking meds. Um, it's not usually a problem for me. Usually I'm, I do a bowl of Cheerios, but I'm on the trail and I'm doing oatmeal. So it's something I'm going to have to get used to. So anyhow, not to digress and get off track. Anyhow, it was that morning, it's the second morning. And uh, the water, I went through all that water. Now, in fairness, it's been 90 degrees during the day because it's the middle of July. And, oh, if you don't know it, a side effect of the anti-rejection meds is stressing out your kidneys to the point where I think 10 or 15% of lung transplant patients burn the kidneys out altogether and need kidney transplants or actually get kidney transplants. So, in order to avoid that, if you're lucky, what you have to do is consume a lot of water. I have to do minimum a half a gallon a day, and uh, you don't really want to do more than two gallons a day. So, I do usually about three quarters of a gallon, three liters a day. But that's home. I'm not doing a whole lot of and not, you know, it's anyhow. So, whew. I'm going to take a break here. Well, this next stretch looks pretty tame, so I'm going to go ahead and start recording again. Let me flip this around. You can't flip it around while it's recording. Interesting. Uh, but you can flip it around once you're done recording. And I have to keep on working on holding up. Up, up, up. And now I'm probably shady completely and can't see anything. But just checking to make sure I put my bottle back. Oh, I didn't. Okay. Good. I put it where I like it. Where the hell was I? So, water is really important. And one of the apps, Gut Hook, which is very good, I suggested if anyone else is going to do the trail, will give you a heads up on where all the water are, all the water spots are. And it will also give you a a symbol for sketchy or great water full water so. and you can add comments if you see something more recent now being july is not raining that much so you know the streams that are you know more populated are got water and the other ones may or may not however and it's not a problem for most people in Georgia because there is plenty of water. If you're walking at at least one mile an hour or one and a half miles an hour and you're getting, you know, eight or ten miles a day, you'll probably pass a water source and be able to fill up. I am not, however, at that point in time. So I was like, uh-oh. And naturally, I don't really want to go on dialysis and have to wait for a new kidney. So, this was weighing on my mind. And I got everything ready to go, packed up, and I grabbed my water kit, location, bag, and bottles and stuff. And I ran back, oh, a half a mile, leaving my stuff in the woods for any critter or bear to get, which may or may not have been a real realistic fear, but at that point, it did weigh on my mind. 
and filled up my water and went about my way for a while but within an hour half my water was gone so looking for the next water spot it's five miles down the road or down the trail and I said wait a minute five miles and I'm lucky if I'm doing four miles a day I'm not gonna make it so now I'm thinking I have to ration water and anyhow I got myself into a tizzy over I looked up the water supplies for things you know the future for the next 20 miles or so and said I can't carry enough water one because of the tebby and two because I didn't have the containers so I was like shit so anyhow I figured plus oh I didn't mention I was having a little trouble walking and uh I, and how I came home and got a new hip put in. So, um, maybe that long story short. So, I decided to call it quits right there and come back next year. Which, I did pretty good. I went ahead and got myself in as good shape as I could. And, unfortunately, the way the medical system works sometimes is they're in no rush. So, I didn't get the hip until I think that was like August. Now, I could still walk around and stuff. It wasn't that bad, but uh, trying to walk 2,000 miles on a bad hip is a little tougher and up and down mountains. So I went ahead and, uh, like I say, put it off for the next year. And I got my new hip Christmas Day, or actually Christmas Eve, I think. So I was in the hospital Christmas Day, anyhow. And then... Uh, what did I do? Um, I had a smashing recovery from that physical therapist, which was very impressive. And uh, I've done well because I was getting in good shape because I was going out April 15th again. So, you know, I asked and they said, yep, you'll be fine. Great. And I went for a checkup in early March or February, late February. And I was all ready and I was just chomping at the bit. And then, well, we all know now about COVID. So, I thought about it for a little while, and I said, well, we'll know better in two weeks. So, I was still going. And then, well, we'll know better in two more weeks. And I said, we'll get to know it was July again, and I said, no way. Because, got to say, it was late June. The London immune system. Yeah, it's a little tougher. Just to hang around the germs. But normally, I've been wearing a mask since 2012 because of the lack of immune system. So I think it was a good idea last year. However, this year, I got my shot. My first shot. And I'm due to get my second shot at the end of March. And I did want to leave when I can to leave March 15th. Because trying to leave April 15th for a couple of years didn't work very well. <laughs> so, anyhow, very long winded story of I'm going to make another attempt to April, early April. It's probably going to be April 1st, which is not the ideal time. It's very crowded. It is usually the most crowded day for Appalachian Trail Start of the whole year. It's like, that's why they pick them at 15th on the other years. It's because you're trying to avoid it. It's called the bubble where everybody is there, it's a big flow, and April 1st is nice because most of the bad weather, the very cold weather, is gone. And, uh, you know, you're still going to be cold and chilly but not, you won't be uh, waist deep in snow like I've seen other people who started in February and early March. <laughs> so, here it is. It's uh, going to be the worst time. I might 
you know, all good a couple of days, or a week or so, one way or the other, you will know after my next physical, which is in two days from now, or three days from now, March 17th. And I have like six appointments that day, and we're going to try and check everything. And hopefully, I think I'll get a, I'll get a green flag from everyone. Nobody will be putting a red flag down. And then I'll get my second shot, and I'll be on my way. That's the plan. Let's see you all in jail. Bye-bye.